Now, again, we have some time in hand, uh, so I can say to members in the open debate, you may have speeches of five minutes. Isn't that exciting for you? Um, the next item of business is a debate on motion 5245 in the name of Edward Mountain. You're working hard today, Mr Mountain. On behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, on its report on a review of priorities for crofting law reform, can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak in now. And I call on Edward Mountain to speak and move the motion on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Mr Mountain, a generous eight minutes, please. Presiding officer, thank you, and I do work hard every day, just for, just for the record. Um, I realised as soon as I said it, that was rather <laughs> unkind. As, as convener of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee, I welcome this debate on the review of priorities for crofting law reform, and I'd like to move the motion in my name. I'd like to thank all those who gave evidence, uh, both oral and written evidence, to the committee. I'd also like to thank the members of the committee for their very positive approach, which I believe has resulted in a positive re report. Furthermore, I'd also like to thank our clerking team who have accurately reflected the de our deliberations in the report that has been published. I'd like to note the Cabinet Secretary's written response to the report, and I look forward to his comments on the specific recommendations within the report in due course. I should point out that the committee, in carrying out its review, acknowledged the significant amount of work that has been already undertaken in this area, including previous reforms of crossing legislation, identification of priorities for further legislative reform by the Crofting Law Group, and work by the Crofting Legislation Stakeholder Consultation Group. All this has highlighted the fact that, despite several recent pieces of crofting legislation, there remain a large number of issues within crofting law that need to be addressed. I should point out that during the evidence session that it became clear to the committee that crofting is not a happy place to be at the moment and to do nothing or to prevaricate is not an option. Turning to the report, the first issue that I think the committee, well, the committee is clear on is the need for a new and clear crofting policy. From the evidence we heard, it is clear that Scotland needs a policy for crofting to make it fit for the 21st century. The government and stakeholders need to develop this policy expeditiously. Once a policy has been identified, then and only then do we believe that the government can design legislation to achieve this. Policy must be delivered by legislation and not the other way round. Legislation to the pre protect the crofters in the 1800s may not be suitable for day, for today, and in some cases it probably isn't. When considering the crofting policy, the committee heard the following issues needing to be addressed. First of all, crofting development. We heard that there has been very little development of crofting happening under HIE. Some felt that since the responsibility for the development of crofting had been passed to the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board under the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010, HIE's focus was primarily on crofting community development rather than on providing support for individual crofters or promoting wider crofting interest. We heard the evidence that development functions should sit with the regulation function with the Commission. What we are clear on is that given the importance of de the development function to the future of crofting, the Scottish Government must seek further views on where this responsibility should lie. We also heard a lot about crofting commissioners. The role of crofting commissioners was raised by more than one person. Indeed, the very first email that I received when I was elected to this parliament was on that very subject. We heard there was some confusion as to whether elected commissioners were required to act on behalf of the whole commission or if they were simply delegates representing their constituencies. We also heard concerns about the role of elected commissioners with one witness, Sir Crispin Agnew, stating that given the Crofting Commission's part in the regulatory system, that it, they were effectively a court with elected judges. It was also clear that the Crofting community have concerns as to the role of commissioners. We heard that a delegated decision-making process was being developed for the commissioners. This means that staff of the Commission will be tasked with making decisions in individual cases with Commissioners having a wider overview of policy. We felt as a committee that the non-executive role for Commissioners should be further developed as a priority. As to the future, it is clear that the role and responsibilities of elected crofters, uh, Commissioners 
should be carefully considered to save internal division and, in some cases, setting crofters against each other. We also heard about the crofting register. The committee heard concerns relating to the register, which was introduced as part of the 2010 Act. The committee, the committee feel that the register is important as, when it is complete, it will be a definitive record of all land in the crofting tenure in Scotland. The costs involved in registration, in particular the costs of meeting public notification requirements via local press advertisement, is a concern. And the committee believes there should be a move towards suitable online solution, removing the need for costly advertising. It welcomes the fact that the Cabinet Secretary is prepared to look at this. The committee also heard that the mapping of common grazings had, had ground to a halt due to a lack of funding. The committee feels that the completion of this important exercise should be prioritised and calls on the Scottish Government and the Crofton Commission to consider how this will be achieved and resourced. We also heard about absenteeism and the neglect of crofts. This is a knotty issue. We heard from some issues that the process for managing cases of absenteeism under the 2010 Act is complicated, time-intensive and difficult to implement. This is fact was acknowledged by the Cabinet Secretary, who has said that he is willing to look at it, and we believe it needs to be streamlined. streamlined sorry. The committee also was surprised to learn that the legal requirement for grazing committees to produce annual reports on matters such as absenteeism and neglect is not being complied with. This is not acceptable and raises the question as whether they should be required and thus enforced or removed. The committee also heard about the, new, the need for new entrants to crofting. If crofting is to flourish, it needs new entrants and we welcome the input from the young crofters. It was clear there are significant barriers to new entrants to crofting. We welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to introduce new entrants scheme for crofting. We also welcome the Cabinet Secretary agreement to explore the potential for areas of common grazing to be used in the creation of new crops as part of this development scheme. We also heard about owner-occupied crops. The issue of how they are to be treated proved interesting. Some said they should be treated as crofters. Some said they should be taken out of the crofting scheme altogether. We heard two different schools of thought on how they should be treated. And the committee believes that this, this issue needs to be examined further. We also heard about common grazings. The committee heard from several witnesses that common grazings, in some cases, have been separated from crofting, with common grazing shares in the hands of some who no longer own crofts. Slipper crofters, if you will. We also heard that there are very narrow agricultural contexts to common grazings under the crofting legislation, and this might not be fit for purpose. We are in no doubt that the legislation and guidance co covering grazing committees needs to be updated to reflect the modern circumstances, such as subsidy payments, environment, renewable opportunities, can be grasped and ensure that the income from these schemes goes back into the crofting community. So finally, to look at the legislative approach. What the committee heard loud and clear was that the crofting sector is blighted by outdated legislation and policy. What we all will agree is that we must play a part ensuring that crofting and the crofting community can move forward with confidence towards a successful and sustainable future. The proposed crofting bill and plan for crofting must therefore be comprehensive and address the modern needs for crofters and crofting. It must deal with all the issues that have been identified. We need to move away from the piecemeal approach of bringing forward crofting acts every few years, which make limited changes. We believe that the Scottish Government must commit to ensuring that the timetable for a new bill allows sufficient time for detailed parliamentary scrutiny and that the passage of the bill is completed comfortably before the end of the current parliamentary session. Uh, presiding officer, I look forward to this debate and hearing the responses to the points that the committee have raised. Thank you. Could you move the motion in your name? Please, I'm sorry, I thought I moved it at the beginning. I moved the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I may have missed it. Uh, I now call Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary, to open for the Government. General, six minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, I'd like to start by thanking the committee for considering crofting so early in the parliamentary session and for taking the time to prepare and publish their report. The Scottish Government supports crofting. We support the crofting way of life. We do so in policy and we do so 
financially. We do so in deeds, presiding officer, as well as uh, words. And this support comes from a package of measures uh, which, as well as that through pillar one of the Common Agricultural Policy, include the following. Around £28 million of less favoured area support for over 6,400 claims in the Crofting counties. The Croft House Grant Scheme, £15 million since 2007, helping to build and improve 800 Croft homes, with £2 million allocated for 2017-18, uh, and some £948,000 of that shared amongst 29 crofters so far. Something that many members have lobbied me hard on, for example, Dr. Allen, particularly in his constituency. The Crofting Agricultural Grant Scheme of 10 million pounds since 2010, approved for over 3,550 applications for capital items such as fencing, sheds, and drainage. The Crofting Cattle Improvement Scheme of 3 million pounds state-of-the-art bull stud, officially opened in 2013 with over 400 uh, beneficiaries each year. The Scottish Rural Development Programme support with £8 million available to help young farmers and crofters set up. Veterinary support of £760,000 per annum. Farm advisory support with around £650,000 per annum, specifically being available to crofters and small farmers in addition to general advice. Uh, much has changed in crofting law, but it's still based on the Crofting, Crofters Holdings Scotland Act 1886. We shall consider modernisation of crofting law within this parliamentary session, but this will be no easy task. The issues are complex, the opinions are diverse, there are no straightforward answers. Our aim in legislation is to get the best outcomes for crofting. Compromise, presiding officer, will be required. The report raises many important issues, and I cannot respond to these individually today. The Scottish Government shall be considering the report in detail as part of the legislative development process. In considering legislation, uh, we must work out what we want crofting to deliver. And I'm pleased to note the committee's report supports that view. We must consider legislation from an open perspective. For example, legislation can take different forms. It could be a tidy up, it could be a consolidation exercise, or it could be a clean sheet approach. I agree with the committee that matters such as common grazings, owner-occupied crofts, encouraging new entrants, crofting regulation, and tensions around small holdings all need to be considered. But the committee's report also makes recommendations on non-legislative aspects of crofting policy, and I welcome this. Legislation, presiding officer, is not necessarily the best way to make improvements. For example, we have made clear that we shall engage with crofting stakeholders to undertake the drafting of a national development plan for crofting as part of a sustainable rural economy. And this plan will help us identify issues that do not necessarily require legislation to address. For example, loans for croft houses. Additionally, new entrants are crucial. And with new blood comes new practices, innovation, and an enthusiasm that energizes that sector. And of course, the, the crofting house grant system and the hundreds of young people that that has enabled to establish a house in their own part of Scotland is a good way to encourage and actually enable young people to be new entrants in crofting. Work has already begun within the Crofting Stakeholder Forum to identify what a new entrance scheme for crofting might look like. And of course, there are existing support measures already available to new entrants. We also wish to consider woodland crofting too. And on Friday last week, I had the pleasure of visiting Loch Arkig, where I had a very useful dialogue with uh, the local community and with the Woodlands Trust uh, about that topic. Now, many will be interested, presiding officer, in the timing of any future bill. 
uh, as previously advised, the decision on the timing of legislation will be taken within the context of the Scottish Government's many legislative priorities. It is important that we take our time to consider what is best for the future of crofting, uh, and it's essential that we get that right. We aim to do so within the lifetime of this Parliament. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the process of creating new legislation should always be an open one. And I know from my own experience that the best solutions are arrived at working together in collaboration after a great deal of thought and discussion. I am grateful for the committee's work in this area and I very much look forward to hearing members' views on this report this afternoon. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I call Jamie Green to open the Conservatives. A generous five minutes, please, Mr Thank Green. You. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, for many months, I have sat on the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, listening to a range of evidence on the future of crofting. And of the 20,500 crofts in Scotland, only one is in my region. But nonetheless, what has become evidently clear is that the current framework of legislation is not fit for purpose. Uh, the Scottish Conservatives, Conservatives welcome the REC Committee's report, and in particular, any measures set out to support new entrants to the industry. I'm also encouraged that the NFUS has also welcomed the report. We want to see an overhaul to the existing framework that not only simplifies legislation, but addresses the issues of what crofting really is in 21st century Scotland. Now, crofting has been part of the fabric of Scotland's rural economy and way of life for centuries. And whilst the economic need for such a localised, self-sustainable way of life has reduced, it is important to preserve this unique way of farming. But in my view, preservation must also mean modernisation. Successive governments have tinkered around the edges of the law. But the current plethora of legislation applying to crofting is quite mind-boggling. Evidence we took on the status quo made it clear that it is nothing short of a legal minefield. So if this parliament is really serious about a long-lasting solution to a century-old debate, then we should be bold. And we should not be content with any bill that creates more tape or causes any more confusion. Historic administrations have fallen into the trap of topping up legislation to fill in gaps. So be it on ownership, registration, mediation, common grazings, mapping, financing, and CAP, much really has changed over the years. And it's a complicated regulatory environment, but it's also a difficult trading environment. This is a very passionate debate. By its very nature, our crofting communities are small, character-led, and lack no shortage of points of views and opinions. But whatever those views, our crofters need to know that the government and this parliament is on their side. At the heart of what we do must be the aim of nurturing and supporting new talent, new entrants, and young farmers. The committee report summarized it well by saying, there is a need to move away from the piecemeal process of legislative development, which has seen several crofting acts being passed in recent years. So as a parliament, we have some choices ahead. Consolidation, simplification, modernization, a new bill, a clean slate. And today I won't suggest which of those options is the best course of action, because I believe that greater minds will deal with that. But the point I want to make today is that clear policy and strategy must come first, not legislation. This debate should be about shaping the future of crofting, not dealing with the problems of its past. Uh, presenting also the average age of a crofter is 59. So it's absolutely vital that we shape a system and therefore legislation around what modern crofting is all about. The Crofting Commission's Colin Kennedy highlighted that of the 44 tenancies terminated in the last couple of years, 30 crofts are still lying vacant, with access to finance being a main barrier to entry. You cannot get a mortgage on something which you do not own. Uh, Dave McKinnon of the SCF Young Crofters gave a similar testimony to us, stating that if access to neglected crofts was eased, then it could attract new uh, entrants and new young crofters to the industry. So crofting policy will need to address how we can open up crofting and make it a viable option for new farmers. As the committee recommends, 
we need to address the structure of the Crofton Commission. Sir Crispin Agnew told the committee that the tribunal aspect of the commissioners should be removed. Should commissioners be appointed or elected? Do they represent the interests of their regional constituencies or the interests of the wider cause? Should the Commission take back responsibility for crofting development? There are many questions to be answered. But the impetus now is on the Scottish Government to produce a clear set of policies on modern crofting. And in doing so, it must address the outcomes of the SUMP report first and foremost. But legislation is not the only way to address many issues, nor should we wait for new legislation before we take some action. The CLSCG uh, recommended in the last session of this Parliament that nine high priority issues should be taken forward before the end of session four of this Parliament. My question is, have they? And if not, why not? In summary, crofting legislation is crying out for simplification and crofters are crying out for clarification. This groundhog day of piecemeal legislation simply must end. My message today is simple. Now is not the time for tinkering. Now is the time to be bold. If the Scottish Government comes forward with a sensible strategy, the Scottish Conservatives will support them. But in the meantime, every day that passes is another missed opportunity to help our crofters. Thank you. I call Rhoda Grant. Uh, around five minutes, please, Ms Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, crofting has developed over years um, since the very first crofting legislation, and it now reflects what is required by each distinct community. In some cases, it simply is a house site with a little land for some livestock or vegetable growing, and in others, it's a working farm providing a livelihood to a family. The governance also differs between areas. In some communities, the grazing com committee manages activity and crofters work collaboratively. But in other areas, there is little or no collaboration and a croft is viewed as someone's private land to farm in any way that they would wish. And therefore, when looking at legislation, any small change can have dire unintended consequences for others. That is the challenge with new crofting law. The Scottish Government legislated in 2010 to change crofting law. They rushed it through at the end of the Parliament and didn't listen to concerns about unintended consequences. Therefore, the 2010 Act created more problems than it solved. And the Scottish Government, to give them their due, have recognised this and have announced that they will bring forward crofting legislation in this Parliament. But they've not indicated, and neither has the Cabinet Secretary indicated today what form that that will take. Will it be righting the wrongs of the 2010 Act using the SUMP as a guide to put right the pressing problems the last legislation created? The SUMP's a list of issues put together by crofting lawyers and specialists that highlights the problems with crofting law as it currently stands. And some of those are tidying up, but others need urgent attention because they're stopping crofters doing what they need to do to secure their home and livelihoods. Will the new legislation be a consolidation act, simply putting, putting the current law into one act but changing nothing? And again, this is something that has been called for because the original act has been amended so many times and many of the problems that are arising are because these pieces of legislation don't fit well together. The third option is to start from basic principles and create a new crofting act and on balance, that is what the committee has supported. However, can I say that that is not without its own challenges? I said earlier that crofting has evolved differently throughout the crofting counties, and for the most part, my constituents value their own form of crofting and how it works in their area. There are indeed areas where there are challenges that need to be met, areas that are pressurised, where land values are high, where holiday homes are sought after. And this has led to crofts being allowed to fall into disrepair, where the croft house has been purchased at a price way above the pocket of local people, but the land is not required. And there are also areas where work is hard to come by, and people have been driven away from their croft to seek a livelihood elsewhere. They have kept their crofts and the family home. Leaving was not their choice, and they longed to return. 
Meanwhile, these crofts are either sublet on an informal basis or work by a cousin or friend, and the house sits empty other than at holiday times. These are the people that are being pursued over absenteeism now. They feel unfairly treated, firstly let down by the lack of provision for the local economy that forced them out in the first place. Now they're being seen as a problem for holding on to what they see as their own heritage. In truth, they're unlikely to be able to return until they retire and probably at that stage don't want to be large scale crofters. Surely there must be a way in which to meet their aspirations to return home and have access to a little land while allowing the bulk of the croft area to be let to a local person or indeed a new family or a young crofter. None of this can be dealt with by a broad brush legislation. Every person, every family, everyone is different and what will work for them will therefore need to be a very personalised solution to their own situation. It may be that there needs to be legislation, it needs to be stripped back to the very basics. The very basics, in my view, are security of tenure, security of inheritance, and <coughs> the right to buy. In return for all of this, the crofter is expected to work their croft and ensure that it does not fall into disrepair. There could also be the ability for localities to look at enhancing the legislation with local regulations that work within their local community to tackle their particular issues and build the economy and thereby leading to greater use of crofting land. What crofting has been successful in doing is slowing down depopulation in many of the crofting counties and that's what it was set up to do and that's what we must protect and enhance. We need to fight depopulation and recognise that people need to be supported to live and work in these communities. Crofting alone will not halt depopulation, but it is an economic driver. And it's therefore essential that we protect crofting and ensure that the legislation is not a barrier, but indeed it is a driver for repopulation of the counties. We now move to the open debate and speeches of five minutes, please. Uh, Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Scott. Buva lum tien a horst gana clavkan agus sahule donye ele arsen gianav. Kintioch guvel na parchen a kudrink. Den a hisk ans a garlic. Kanya avor to deskiren croftir acht. For the Anglophones and for those who cannot interpret my mispronounced Gaelic, I thank uh, our clerks and others for ensuring that key parts of the report have been rendered in the native language of most of our crofting areas, in other words, in Gaelic. We should remember, of course, that the first act the Crofters Holding Scotland Act of 1886 required that one of the three commissioners spoke Gaelic. And recognising the legal complexities that uh, one of the commissioners be a Scottish advocate of at least 10 years standing. Because this is indeed a complex area of law drawing on rural agricultural tradition, court cases and many generations of parliamentary uh, consideration and legislation. It is frankly a pretty substantial guddle. But we simply mustn't let the complexity and contentious natures of many of the issues in crofting to be another reason for only moving forward uh, by limiting the government's response to cherry picking some of the easy bits. The Sump report to which uh, Jamie Green and Rhoda Grant referred at least gives an opportunity for action in areas where there is as complete an agreement as there's likely to be uh, for us to be able to reach. But we need some big picture stuff as well. Uh, let me start with uh, some governance and oversight. Now, my personal hand sits on this to some extent as the minister who signed the Crofting Commission Election Scotland Regulations 2011, uh, and it is the Crofting Reform Act 2010 at Schedule 1, Section 575A that prove we can be radical. It provides for the election to the Crofting Commission uh, of people aged 16 or over and follows a similar provision in the 2009 Act 
covering elections to health boards. We've broken new ground in empowering 16 and 17 year olds in this way. I don't believe that that's been done anywhere else in a similar way in legislation uh, elsewhere in the UK. So the fundamental question is, what are members of the Commission there for? Firstly, they are not, repeat, not there to manage the work of officials. But they are absolutely there uh, to hold them to account and to set policy. And in doing so, they are there to represent the interests, I believe, collectively, of all crofters and people in crofting communities. It should not be a surprise that responsibility must extend beyond crofters. In fact, uh, one does not even have to be a crofter to stand for election uh, for the Commission, albeit that a, a, a non-crofter must be nominated by a crofter. Elected members are there because of votes in the six constituencies, but it's vital that collective positions are reached by the members of the Commission and then taken forward uh, on a unanimous basis. They are not there. It's not useful if they think they are there simply to represent the area that elected them. Now, that's a substantial challenge that's laid down, uh, but I hope it's one that members of the Commission will rise to. Moving on, we must, uh, as others have referred to, complete proper, accurate mapping of crops and shared grazings. As Transport Minister, I was party to a dispute about where the boundary was between Crofting Land and Bembecula Airport. The diagram that was in the register of Sacines was a pretty small diagram with a China graph line. When you mapped it up, that line was 100 metres wide. You begin to understand where the dispute actually came from. It was a recipe for argument. We've also had reference, and I support, we must simplify the administration of common grazings and create a better structure. Now, before the 1886 Act, which recognised the rights of crofters, the, the Act opens security of tenure uh, that brought to an end the forced ejection of people from the land they'd occupied for generations. It ended the clearances. But life on the croft remains somewhat precarious. I look forward now to the government's planned legislation, trust this work by the committee helpfully augments their and other research. Presiding officer. I call John Scott, who followed by John Finney. Presiding officer, can I begin by declaring an interest as a landowner and farmer, albeit with no crofting interests. Can I also welcome this debate and the review of priorities for crofting law reform I note, like many less favoured area farmers, most crofters are struggling to make ends meet in the current financial climate. And the recently published net farm income figures are further proof that what historically was a difficult way of life has in recent times become still more difficult and financially unrewarding. However, presiding officer, it's been my long-held view that crofting communities are a vital part of Scottish life and culture and keep communities going where otherwise they would not exist and should be supported wherever possible. Others have noted at different times that crofting is an island in a sea of legislation and in that regard I was a member of the Rural Affairs Committee which helped create the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010 seven years ago and I regret to note that the problems highlighted in the recent committee report are depressingly similar to the ones identified almost 10 years ago in the Shucksmith report and more recently in the 2014 SRUC report. So, presiding officer, I know how much went into the 2010 Act and I would support the view that if the 2010 Act and the subsequent Croft Amendment Scotland Act 2013 are regarded as not being fit for purpose, Parliament should endeavour to improve on the legislation. However, I remain to be convinced that a completely new bill is required, as has been suggested. The 2010 bill has hardly had time to bed in yet, never mind being regarded as not fit for purpose. And this is because so many of the problems associated with crofting are not about the legislation, as Rhoda Grant has said, but are much more about the viability of crofting and the commitment to crofting itself as a way of life. In my view, succession and the viability remain the biggest threat to the future of crofting, and no amount of legislation will overcome these fundamental and structural problems. 
nor, in my view, will the creation of new legislation address most of the barriers to entry and occupancy of crofts, which include the cost of purchasing assignations, the lack of knowledge of vacant crofts, the difficulty in obtaining finance to buy assignations, the high capital cost of establishing enterprises, or the cost of returning neglected crofts to use, or the lack of financial return from crofting. However, if there is a perceived need for change, then the committee should undertake post-legislative scrutiny of the 2010 Act as a precursor to further action. If post-legislative scrutiny of the 2010 Act finds areas that are universally, and I stress the word universally, agreed as needing to be improved on, then secondary legislation, perhaps by statutory instrument, if such powers exist in the Act, or even just clearer guidance, if appropriate, should be considered to achieve this. Failing that, further amending primary legislation could be considered, but not until it becomes clear that it is absolutely necessary or that it will make a fundamental difference to the problems facing crofting, most of which, in my view, are not a function of legislation. Some of the changes in the 2010 Act were foreseen as taking perhaps a generation to make a real difference and were delivered after much consultation with leading crofting and legal practitioners at the time. Delivering legislation agreed by all is never easy, but amending this legislation should be considered if a clear and unequivocal need can be identified and a consensus built around it. So, Presiding Officer, I congratulate the committee and its clerks on the production of this report. But given our Parliament's track record on the production of crofting legislation, I am certain the Government will want to approach the creation of new legislation, of course with enthusiasm and with an open mind, but also with extreme caution, as a huge amount of parliamentary time and resource has already been spent on crofting legislation since our Parliament came into existence. 18 years ago. I wish the government and the committee well in whatever they see as the appropriate way forward. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, as has been alluded to by our uh, committee chair, uh, the committee took on this piece of work at a time when there was a lot of controversy, particularly around um, grazing committees. So uh, it, it was a timely piece of work, I think. Um, and it was a very clear signal that was given by the committee of the priority that was placed on crofting that it took place. But I think it's important to say, as is evident from some of the contributions already, that this is just going to be part of a process. Um, the committee report said the committee considers the Scottish Government's proposed bill pri provides a legislative platform which fits the reality of modern crofting practices. That's true, but of course, as we've heard already, that's a very complex mesh of... of uh, situations and crofting epitomizes the reality of the challenges faced by rural communities um, and like many I would like to thank the witnesses um, who caused us to have an informed debate because as ever um, it's better if you have the participation of people who are going to be directly affected and I thought that was very helpful. Again the, the, the report talks about the su sustainable crofting sector and I would say that that doesn't stand in isolation from the future of all our rural communities. So questions around the role that crofting can and should play in the future of our communities. Uh, Depopulation has already been alluded to. Uh, and whilst primarily it's our Island Butte that's affected by that, then within each of the local authority areas, there will be particular um, places where um, there has been depopulation and the age profile is such that it, it certainly wouldn't lend itself to being considered a sustainable long-term uh, community. Uh, and the report that we produced talked about uh, it has to be relevant to the needs and aspirations. And, and I would, um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary alluded to the importance of housing. That is absolutely key to everything. Any, any uh, member of uh, this Parliament, um, I'd be surprised if housing wasn't a significant, if not the largest part of, of the, their workload. Um, it's key in any community, and of course there's particular challenges in rural community. So, the, 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 in fact, I, 
I cut and pasted from a, a, a press release from the Cabinet Secretary, which actually gave the figure of 16 million rather than 15 million. But anyway, lots of millions and all welcome and two million for the coming year. And which said it was about attracting people, particularly young families, to our remote and rural communities and is essential for the long term sustainability. That is key to everything. So I, I, I certainly commend the investment that goes into that. Um, people have used the term from the report about moving away from piecemeal legislation and I would again pose the question, what's the purpose of legislation? It's not to tie us down in endless arguments and we certainly know we have endless legislation about crofting. I, in my view, it's rather to facilitate the delivery of uh, what is the subject of the legislation. And it is the, the view of the committee that the, the bill should be comprehensive. And the arguments have been had about consolidation versus new legislation. Um, but I think we all agree that this isn't ever to be seen as an opportunity to remove the issue off into the long grass. Um, the, the committee uh, seeks to address a number of very current issues uh, and as, as many have alluded to, we've been here before, um, the Shucksmith report um, and in relation to that we see the recommendations contained in the SUMP report should form the starting point for further consideration of legislative reform proposals. Um, and we do talk about uh, it should be accompanied by comprehensive and accessible uh, guidance documents to allow those involved in Crofty to more easily understand and implement the, the, the provisions. Yes, absolutely agree with that. But lots of legislation and little guidance or modest legislation and lots of guidance, I think the reality is that we can say that crofters don't want reams of paper. They want some clarity about the direction. And that's the clarity of the direction that we want about all our rural communities. And, and of course, there's Brexit to be figured into that because of the sums of money that come from Europe. Um, yes, we want sufficient time for scrutiny because it is important it's done right. Um, but as has been said by um, a number of speakers, uh, legislation isn't required to address everything. And, uh, and, and as has been said, we're very keen that the issue, issues don't await, that don't require legislating upon, uh, don't uh, get lost in the process. Um, I noticed the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the National Development Plan, and obviously a longer term plan is absolutely key. And we, we heard frustrations about crofting development um, um, and the role that high now play. And perhaps there is a misunderstanding. Well, we all in this chamber talk about the Christie principles of, of local um, public bodies working together. And I don't think it's necessarily down to any one agency. There has to be collaboration across local authorities, the government agencies, and some of the agencies directly involved in crofting. And given the time, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Sir. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by John Mason. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I first heard the definition of what a croft is from Charles Kennedy, who told me that a croft is a piece of land surrounded by legislation. And OK, uh, maybe it wasn't an original definition, but I thought to describe the whole issue exactly. Um, so that's a very welcome opportunity to debate the future of crossing in advance of the uh, Scottish Government's expected legislation later in the parliamentary session. And that's why I'm in favour of a clean slate approach to the legislation. John Finney has just spoken about the need for clarity. And I think if we go down the route, and, and you know, if the Scottish Government decide to go down the route of adding a piece of legislation to the already vast amounts of legislation that cover crofting, I think it'd be far better, this is my, my view, far from taken from the evidence that we've heard, that uh, we have a clean slate approach, so we, ha we get that clarity for the future. So I think the committee has worked well together to produce a unanimous report, and hopefully the evidence we've received will, will help inform the Scottish Government of the best way to proceed, because everyone on the committee felt that it was, and, and these phrases have been repeated, I make no uh, um, apologies for repeating them, that it was of fundamental importance that the proposed bill does fit with the reality of modern crofting practices. It's relevant to the needs and aspirations of crofters and aims to deliver a sustainable crofting sector. If we get that right, then it will be dramatically important for the crofting community. We all agreed on the committee that there is a real need to move away from the piecemeal process of legislative development. Um, the Liberal Democrats, as I say, we believe that the pros bill should be comprehensive and seek to address all of these issues. Um, now, not everything needs uh, legislation 
to be reformed. And we made that clear in the report. And they are urgent um, reforms, and the Scottish need, uh, government needs to take action on them as soon as possible. Many of these issues can be found in the so-called Sump Report on page 29 of the committee's report. And I think there's general agreement that we, the government needs to tackle these issues um, uh, directly and, and, and relatively quickly. The committee looked at many issues that are either causing problems or that are in need of reform. I've got a whole list of them. We could actually have a debate on each and every one of them, but we obviously don't have time to do that. From absenteeism and the ne neglect of Crofts, it's heartbreaking to many to see absentee Crofts not utilised properly. The support for new entrants to Crofting, particularly over the difficulties of obtaining a mortgage on what is rented land, and I know the Minister mentioned that in the opening uh, remarks, and I think that uh, he'd get support from a, across the chamber if that particular issue could be addressed reasonably quickly. The issue of owner-occupied crofts, and that might sound um, strange, owner-occupied crofts, but that is an issue of, of, uh, of whether they are crofts or not. Common grazings. We found that the law on common grazings are not being upheld. Um, it's interesting passing legislation, but if you pass legislation, we actually do need to uphold it. Uh, the crofting register. The role of the elected members has been mentioned a lot about the crofting commission. Uh, Edward Mountain mentioned the crof crofting development, the role of Highlands and Islands, and, uh, Highlands and Islands development. The issue of small land holdings elsewhere than in the crofting counties. And um, Jimmy mentioned that he had one in his region. Uh, and the relationship they might have with crofting, important. Um, what is a croft? Is it down to just geographical um, location? If we had time, as I say, we could debate all of these. All of these, and I realise I'm running out of time. But um, suffice it to say that the 11 members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee have worked together constructively to produce a report on these issues, which I hope the Cabinet Secretary will take on board. I believe that it's constructive and well thought through report that the Minister and his civil service team will, as a result of the work, know exactly where committee members are coming from when we examine the forthcoming crofting bill when it's laid before the committee in due course. Okay. We now move to the last of the open debate speeches, and that's John Mason. A uh, presiding officer, uh, crofting is a, clearly a key part of Scotland's heritage and continues to be key in our national use of land. Now, I'm relatively new to crofting legislation, and clearly it's a very complex area, as others have said. But I think it's worth saying that many people in the cities, and the lowlands more generally, do feel very much a, warm, a strong warmth and commitment towards crofting and the struggles that crofters have faced over the years to achieve many of the rights that they have today. Now, one of the purposes of crofting, as Rhoda Grant has said, is to maintain population in the remote rural areas. And that's not just a concern for the people of these areas or for the Highland or Western Isles councils. I consider this to be a national concern. Cities are great and I love living in and representing a city, but Scotland cannot consist just of cities. The whole nation suffers if we do not have a strong and thriving population in the Highlands and Islands. Now, one of the key questions the committee has faced was whether there should be speedy tidying up legislation focused on the Sump Report, or whether we should recommend moving straight to a major consolidation and simplification. And clearly we've heard already today uh, words like clean slate and clarity from Mike Rumbles, uh, but I think John Scott disagrees uh, with moving quickly at least into that approach. And I think as a committee we realized that this was going to be potentially a controversial area, as to what kind of legislation we should recommend. And I think at one stage in the committee, we had thought of really sidestepping this issue altogether and not coming to one agreement. But I think we were all somewhat surprised, perhaps, that as committee members, as we listened to the evidence, we were all pretty well independently convinced, and therefore convinced as a committee, eh, that we could make one recommendation on that. And that was in the second bullet point of the summary, the committee is also of the view that there is a need to move away from the piecemeal process of legislative development, which has seen several crofting acts being passed in recent years. The proposed bill should therefore be comprehensive 
and seek to address as many of the issues identified. We did actually disagree, I think, over this word piecemeal, which Mike Rumbles liked, because previously in the draft it said iterative, which I personally did prefer, um, but will not lose too much sleep over that. Linked to the question uh, of what kind of legislation has been the question of timescale, and that has also been mentioned uh, today. And uh, again, in the fifth bullet point, it says, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to commit to ensuring that the bill timetable will be structured in a manner which will allow sufficient time for thorough and detailed parliamentary scrutiny and the passage of the bill is completed comfortably before the end of the current parliamentary legislation, a session, sorry. And I think uh, if I understood the Cabinet Secretary correctly, he committed to that, and so I do very much uh, welcome that. And we do believe it should be possible to have a major piece of legislation going through during this Parliament. And that means it should happen by May 2021, but it also means that it should be well through its process by the summer of 2020, which is not really that far ahead because I do not think we want to be rushing into the last year of this Parliament with a major piece of legislation, as happened with land reform, eh, and repeat that eh, process. Now, the committee also agreed there needs to be a clear statement on crofting policy. If, eh, if there is such an overarching policy, it will help guide us eh, in considering some of the difficult areas, like whether those who are owner-occupiers of crofts should be treated in the same way as those who are renting. We spent, certainly spent time considering common grazings and points included the need for mapping to be completed. Clearly nowadays there is a wider range of options for the use of such land, for example wind farms, and the current legislation was not anticipating that when it was written. As a relative newcomer to crofting legislation, I think I and others may struggle to understand why the croft itself and the related share in common grazing were ever allowed to be separated from each other. We also looked at crofting development and whether or not there should be a transfer of responsibilities away from HIE. The jury still seems to be out on that one, but part of me does wonder if crofting, which has such a traditional route to it, does fit well with an agency like HIE, which, which is perhaps uh, emphasising other matters. So I do look forward very much to the bill when it comes and engaging more in the detail of crofting at that time, but I would just re-emphasise as a city MSP in closing that crofting in our remote areas are extremely important to our cities, to Glasgow, and to the whole of Scotland. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Rhoda Grant. Around five minutes, please, Ms Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been a short debate, but I think it's been a useful debate, um, covering many of the issues that the committee looked at. Um, I think we all smile when we hear the definition of crofting being a small piece of land surrounded by legislation and I think that was one thing that was proved to us in the committee as we started to look at the legislation and what it was going to do. But surely it must need legislation um, to protect it, but that legislation can be simple. Um, and I think it can be greatly simplified without damaging crofting. It needs to make sense to crofters, it needs to be easily understood and I suppose if we achieve this we might put some lawyers out of business but I think it would be to the benefit of crofting. Um, I think it was Edward Mountain that talked about the annual reports and I just want to make um, a point about that. When the 2010 Act was going through, many of us were really concerned about the reporting functions um, and annual reports um, put on grazing committees, basically making them police their colleagues. And the clerk of the grazing committee is elected by the shareholders of the common grazing, and they were then supposed to report back on the misdemeanours of the shareholders that had elected them to that position. Um, we warned about it and I think that's been borne out because I don't think one annual report has been received from a grazing's committee. I wouldn't say something has to be done about it. I would say that this provision must be removed because it was wrong. Um, we said it was wrong in the first place and we've been, that has been proven to be the, the position. So it needs to go. Um, people should not have to police their neighbours. A number of speakers... I will. And accept that the intention... Excuse me. John Scott. Oh, forgive me, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Would Rhoda Grant accept that the intention at that time was to do nothing other than to encourage active crofting, uh, um, and that has not yet happened? 
Uh, can I remind members that uh, for the purposes of the official report, we really need to say who's about to speak. Rhoda Grant. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think John Scott is maybe aware, given his previous roles <laughs> of that, he may have, have forgotten that he should wait until he is announced by the Presiding Officer. Um, I, I agree with him. That was, that was the, the reason for that provision. But that provision wasn't going to make that happen, as has been borne out. It has not happened. We still have crofts that are not worked, and we have no way of reporting on them, or indeed in, encouraging crofters to do that. So I think that just bears out the point I was making, that that provision has not worked in the legislature. Legislation. Um, a number of speakers um, talked about the strategy um, and the need of a strategy, and I think the whole committee were agreed on that. Um, John Finney said it needs to fit the needs and the aspirations of crofters, and I think that really it has to be the aim of the strategy, and it needs consultation to make sure it's right. Um, we need to look at the economics of crofting, as John Scott talked about in his speech, about the cost of buying and improving land, but also about the lack of financial return from crofting. And I think this is a long-standing problem, not just um, for crofting, but indeed for all the land-based industries, as we have been reading indeed in the press lately. We need to look at how a land-based industries work economically um, make sure that they provide an income or indeed support an income um, because at the moment I've heard a lot of crofters say that they're actually involved in a very expensive hobby. That is not economic uh, generation and we need to make sure that there is a return for that in order to keep people in the glens. Many speakers talked about the development function as well. The development function had gone to Highlands and Islands Enterprise, but that was crofting community development. What the Crofters Commission had done previously was to develop individual crofting businesses and indeed grazing committee businesses, um, encouraging them to take on different projects to make their crofts more viable. That's the bit that has gone missing, and we need to make sure that crofters have um, business development support. There are a number of other issues. The SUMP report, um, we need, to, I think Jamie Green had said, an action plan on the SUMP report. What needs legislation? What can be dealt with um, through subordinate legislation or, or indeed ministerial direction? And I think that would be a good place to start to deal with some of those issues um, that are coming forward and indeed the more urgent issues that are there. Um, the same with grazing's mapping. You know, is there going to be more funding to the Crofting Commission to get this completed? Because I think everyone who spoke to the committee said it was necessary and needed to be finished. And indeed, what's most crucial is the timing of the legislation to make sure that is carried out in enough time to allow us to go out and consult again if there is to be new legislation rather than put things through hoping for the best. I think I've come to the end of my additional time um, that I was granted by the presiding officer. So just in conclusion, I think we have to build consensus around the changes that are required. Not just consensus by those who speak the loudest, but those crofters who go quietly about their business trying to make a living for themselves. I think we need to bear them in mind and indeed thank everybody who contributed to the committee report. I call Peter Chapman again around five minutes, please, Mr Chapman. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I refer members to my register of interests as a landowner and farmer. I welcome this debate and I'm delighted to be speaking in it. And it has been a useful debate. Crofting, as we know, is not just a vital part of a rural economy. It is an important part of Scotland's heritage, particularly in the west of Scotland and the Highlands and Islands. And with over 20,000 crofts registers with the Crofting Commission, it is clear that a significant number of crofters will also be, be waiting to see what the Scottish Government does on this matter. And bluntly, in my opinion, and it is a personal opinion, we cannot duck the question of serious reform any longer. And I've, I'm afraid I have to disagree with my colleague John Scott on this and agree with Mike Rumbles. Because... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Does sometimes happen, Mike. And I, I urge the Scottish Government to come forward with a comprehensive bill to address the maximum number of community concerns in a new, simplified format. In short, I believe we need to start with a clean sheet and draw up simple and clear rules for the governance of crofting, rules which the layman can understand without the need of expensive lawyers 
to interpret. And we have seen over the years amendment after amendment of crofting law that has only created more bureaucracy and confusion. And we heard Sir Crispin Agnew say, the crofting legislation is not fit for pur purpose because it does not have an underlying policy theme that is appropriate to the present day and age. I couldn't agree more. And I do welcome the promise from the Cabinet Secretary that a new bill will be delivered during the lifetime of this Parliament. And there are lots of problems right now. For example, the cost of registration and notification is a problem that was highlight highlighted by Colin Kennedy as not only being overly bureaucratic, but I also quote, he said, represents a huge amount of money coming out of crofting. And Edward Mountain referred to that as well. And as the Rec, Rec Committee has set out, we also need to tackle the issue of mapping of common grazings. This exercise is stopped due to lack of funds. And I hope that ministers will give this the high priority and funding it deserves, because I believe we cannot make progress on crofting as a whole without having accurate mapping in place. We also need to consider whether commissioners should be appointed rather than elected. That was brought up during their evidence sessions. There is also the question of the commission being responsible for crofting development rather than high. And again, Edmund Mountain and John Mason both referred to this as something that we heard during the, the conversations. We also face similar challenges in crofting as we do with farming as a whole, namely a lack of new entrants and a lack of profitability. And with crofts tending to be smaller and more dependent on cap payments than non-crofters, getting the new legislative framework right will be incredibly important in securing a sustainable future for crofting. Indeed. Marie Todd. Thank you for taking the intervention. In the interest of my constituents back in the Highlands and Islands, I wanted to ask if you still consider that crofters are not real farmers. I, I can allow time for, for the intervention, Mr Chapman. I don't think that was absolute, actually very appropriate. I, I accept that crofters do a, a, a fantastic job in their own area. There is also the question, we face similar challenges as crofting as we do uh, profitability. And the Carb Sec Cabinet Secretary outlined in detail some of the, the extra grants that the crofting uh, uh, areas can receive, the Croft House Scheme, the Bull Stud, uh, and Elfast monies, etc. Now, Donald McKinnon of the Scottish Crofters, Young Crofters, has raised the prospect of allowing increased access to neglected croft, potentially providing an opportunity for new entrants and young crofters. And Jamie Green also highlighted this issue. And furthermore, Mr McKinnon has also pointed out to the, the opportunities from Brexit. You know, indeed, with more focus on environmental issues post-Brexit, there could be a better way to support crofting. And there is, no doubt much, there is no doubt much to be said for such an idea. And I hope that the Scottish Government will look closely at it. Presiding officer, I am in no doubt that we need a clean slate for crofting. That is doubly important now as we prepare to leave the EU. And, and on leaving CAP, we will have the opportunity to include specific measures to support crofting under our own system. And this is an opportunity that we need to grasp with both hands. And it is incumbent on every MSP here to help deliver this opportunity for our crofting communities. Thank you. I now call Hamza Yousaf. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the committee, uh, the clerks, and of course, for producing an excellent report, uh, along, of course, with the contribution from committee members uh, today. I think it's been an excellent debate, a little short debate. Uh, many uh, interesting issues have been raised, uh, and perhaps, I'll, of course, I will touch upon them uh, during the course of my speech. Uh, much uh, like uh, John Mason, who spoke in this debate, uh, representing uh, myself representing Glasgow Pollock don't have much in the way uh, of Crofts at all. That's why it was incredibly important for me uh, when I was first appointed as Minister for Transport and the Islands uh, during my island tours to make sure that I went out to Croft and spoke to Crofters uh, to hear uh, some of the issues that were affecting them. Uh, and I have to say many of them, if not all of them, have almost been, uh, has been raised uh, in this uh, debate. So I thank members uh, for a very, very good uh, debate uh, indeed and of course crofting is so important to long-term sustainability of many communities this is particularly true in the islands where there is uh, a depopulation issue which I think Rhoda Grant 
uh, touched upon depopulation uh, on our islands uh, is an issue particularly affecting the Western Isles, uh, as well as many other uh, island uh, communities uh, as well. Now, uh, depopulation, uh, the many, many reasons for that, housing, education, jobs, healthcare, but undoubtedly uh, crofting uh, could provide a solution to uh, reversing some of that depopulation, uh, some, of this, some of that depopulation. Uh, I think today's uh, debate highlights the importance which we all place in crofting in the Highlands and Islands and our desire, collective desire, to make uh, that, excess, uh, that, that a success. From the recommendations made by the committee and from the discussions uh, today, we see that there are a number of issues and often there isn't agreement on how to necessarily tackle uh, those uh, issues. We will, of course, work in a consensual approach, uh, in a consensual way, uh, as much as we possibly can to try to get and take the Parliament with us uh, once we get to the legislative, um, uh, perhaps, uh, solution to this. But importantly, as many members have said, this is not just about legislation. Now, on that point of differences of, of, of opinion, uh, this debate has helped to demonstrate what I have found, what the Cabinet Secretary has found, and what other members have found when they speak to Crofters, that there are a multitude of uh, opinions among Crofters themselves about how to tackle uh, these very uh, important issues. We've seen it today to the extent that, of course, Peter Chapman's disowned his own uh, colleague and, in fact, that he's agreed with uh, Mike Rumbles. Uh, it shows yourself that there's many, many uh, differences of opinion uh, across uh, this chamber. Some have asked for a clean slate approach when it comes to legislation. Others have said perhaps we should add to the legislation. Others have said that we should perhaps tweak existing legislation. That goes to show that there's a number of different opinions and therefore we have to take our time. Uh, but importantly, uh, of course, uh, when it comes to, uh, as members have said, uh, we should come forward with the policy intent and then the legislation uh, should follow uh, thereafter. Uh, we've heard today about the importance of crofting to rural Scotland and the special place that it has for our heritage. Uh, as we have heard, uh, issues such as uh, common grazing's right to buy, uh, owner occupation, absenteeism, neglect, future support from crofting uh, are all uh, important aspects uh, of crofting policy. Perhaps I can just touch upon uh, one uh, or two of them, uh, presiding uh, officer. Uh, in terms of support for new entrants, that was a common theme uh, mentioned by almost uh, every single member. That new lifeblood uh, within that comes uh, innovation, comes an impetus, comes energy uh, as well for that uh, particular sector. So I'd like to thank uh, the committee for its recommendations uh, on that. As members have already noted, work has already begun uh, within the Crofting Stakeholder Forum to identify what a new entrance scheme uh, might well look like. And there are already, of course, some grants, uh, some support available uh, for uh, new entrants and for crofting uh, startups uh, as well. In terms of absenteeism and, and neglect, and I think it's important to just make the point that these are two separate issues, often uh, um, used synonymously, but I think that would be uh, wrong for us uh, to do so. In the context of um, uh, new legislation, absenteeism and uh, neglect of crofts uh, will be look at, looked at. Uh, our officials are engaging with members, again, of the forum. Um, but they are uh, looking at these uh, issues uh, in, in, in great detail. And again, as members have already mentioned in their own contributions, uh, there is not a simple solution to each of these problems, uh, each of these uh, issues. I think they are very complex. Uh, and whether they're not, uh, whether our solutions, of course, when we when we come forward with solutions, they of course often have to be and uh, will have to be compliant uh, with uh, legislation, both domestic and potentially, of course, uh, even European uh, as well. Um, Addressing these issues is not all about making new legislation, again, as members uh, have said, in parallel to examining those issues which will require new crofting law, we need to see what we can do now in relation to current crofting policy uh, and what else uh, might we do uh, without uh, the need for legislative change. I think the point that John Finney made on this was very, very important, uh, that what doesn't require legislation shouldn't be lost while we're very firmly focused on what legislative solution uh, we can uh, bring forward. Uh, just to, I won't go through the, the, the entire list uh, in detail of uh, uh, all of those uh, things that we're doing that are out with uh, legislation, but it is worth reiterating, uh, presiding uh, officer, that we do have the Croft House uh, grant, the less uh, favoured area scheme, of course, that has been mentioned uh, by my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary, the Crofting Agricultural Grant Scheme, uh, the Crofting Cattle Improvement Scheme, Scottish Rural Development Programme, Young Farmers Startup Grant, New Entrant Startup Grant. Crofters and Smallholders Skills Boost 2016. There's also veterinary support available for our crofters, uh, as well as, of course, all the support from the Farm 
uh, advisory service. So it would be ungenerous uh, to suggest that the government uh, isn't providing uh, support uh, to our crofters, with the uh, understanding, of course, that we're looking uh, to see how we can uh, go, go further. Um, this will require time. Uh, the questions and issues raised are, are ones that don't come with a, a very simple solution. Uh, so I would uh, urge uh, some level of patience, which I think members uh, across the chamber have already said that they, they, they understood. Uh, the committee has said that we should start from a position of having a clear overarching crofting policy. I think that's a very eminently uh, sensible uh, suggestion. I agree that we need to have uh, clarity uh, on the future of crofting going forward and work uh, such as that that is being undertaken by the National Development Plan for Crofting will help us to achieve this. Will the Minister take any intervention? Of course. No. Fairly quick one, please, Mr Stevenson. Um, th th there's been little reference to community-owned crofting areas. Um, is the Minister uh, of the view that it continues to be a valuable part of uh, crofting ownership and operation? Short answer would be uh, yes. Uh, and I know that some members uh, did take a little bit of aim at HIE uh, for not getting involved. I would say HIB, HIE have been instrumental when it's come to community land uh, ownership and perhaps the point that uh, Mr Stevenson uh, is making. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, no, there's oh, no more time no, for that, I'm My, my apologies. So uh, I will wind up by, by, by saying that uh, our engagement with stake stakeholders will continue, uh, with crofters, with land owners, the NFUS, with young crofters. I would say that the SUMP report that was mentioned by members, I think, almost in every contribution is also a very good uh, report, which, of course, uh, we will look to examine in greater detail uh, as we move uh, forward. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, from our discussions today, there are a wide range of actions that we might undertake in support of the future of crofting. I look forward to engaging with crofters, uh, crofting communities, the, the REC committee, of course, and this parliament as we take the legislative process forward. I now call Gail Ross to close the debate on behalf of the committee, which name I can't remember off the top of my head. Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. <laughs> Can you take us up to five o'clock, please? Thank you, President Officer. I will try my best to make sense of all the scribbles that I have here. Um, as the convener stated in his opening remarks, we have been working towards this report and uh, the subsequent debate as a committee for a number of months and taken evidence from numerous expert witnesses. And I would also like to put my thanks on record to them, to my fellow committee members and the clerks and also the team from SPICE. We have spent a great deal of time on what is a very complex and technical area and the evidence we have received has helped inform this report and today's debate. The report had three main objectives, to inform the activity already undertaken by stakeholders in the Scottish Government in working towards a reform of crofting law, to allow the committee to make an assessment of the priority action that has so far been identified, and to make any recommendations on action considered necessary to progress that reform process. And we also note the 57 issues in the Crofting Law Sump, which was published by the Crofting Law Group in 2014, a lot of which are priorities for the sector, and we have stated that these should underpin any future legislation. And many members mentioned today that there are some issues that can be resolved without legislation and that they must be addressed, and these are the ones that we talked about in the Sump report. Rhoda Grant suggested that that would be a good place to start. Um, President Officer, this has been an interesting and worthwhile, if short, debate on an issue which is of huge significance to our crofting communities and to rural Scotland more generally. Um, the convener, Edward Mountain, started off by suggesting the need for new crofting policy. And he's absolutely correct that legislation made in the 1800s is probably not relevant um, for today. And several members, in fact, most members that spoke in the debate, Jamie Green, Rhoda Grant, John Finney, John Mason, asked the question that we asked as a committee, do we build on what's already there or do we start again? And I do note that there was some um, division about what we do. John Scott spoke about um, the 2010 legislation that he helped to um, put together. Did um, you take an intervention? Yes. Emma Harper. Yeah. 
Thank you. I know I'm sitting beside you and I could probably ask you later, but it might be worth getting this on the record. I've been listening to the debate this afternoon about crofting legislation. And as a member from the southwest of Scotland, we have 104 small holdings instead of crofts. So I'm curious as to what the committee's uh, view is on the suggestion that crofting and small holding legislation should be combined. Gail Ross. Um, there are very differing opinions on whether uh, the legislation should be combined and the committee took no opinion on that, quite sensibly, I think, and we are going to leave that to wider consultation. Um, so back to uh, what John Scott was saying about the 2010 legislation and his opinion is that it needs time to bed in um, and it's only a perceived need for change, but I must say that uh, most, if not all, of the witnesses that we spoke to um, during the evidence sessions uh, were also of the opinion that there needs to be some sort of change. Now, we did talk about whether that was a clean slate or whether we do build on what's already there. Um, I think as a committee, we came uh, to the conclusion that the bill should be comprehensive and that we should try as much as we can to start again. Um, Jamie Green talked about uh, what crofting is in the 21st century and Rhoda Grant also spoke about the need for uh, a definition. Um, Rhoda also spoke about um, the, the divisions even within the crofting community <coughs> about what the definition of crofting actually is and I think it would be a good place to start to actually get the definition, decide what it is that we want crofting to do for us in this day and age and, and move on from there. Um, I also note that Jamie Green um, used the words mind-boggling in regard to the legislation. And I think that um, when our committee began this process, um, certainly I was a bit overwhelmed with the amount of legislation and, and what it all actually meant. And it was interesting to take evidence from some um, law professors who were also, I wouldn't say confused, but they also agreed that maybe it was a little bit... Um, of a, a minefield, which is also, I think, a word that um, Jamie Green used. Um, Jamie Green also spoke about new entrants, um, as did Mike Rumbles, and the access to mortgages and finance. And that certainly is um, a barrier to new entrants, and it's something that um, the Cabinet Secretary has said he will give due consideration to. Uh, Stuart Stevenson gave a fantastic introduction in Gaelic, and... Uh, I was so engrossed that I nearly forgot to take notes. Um, whereas Jamie Green used the words mind-boggling, uh, Stuart Stevenson said it was a burich, and um, I think the committee would not disagree with that as well. Um, he gave us a good insight into the overview of elections to the Crofting Commission. He spoke about 16 and 17-year-olds being elected and uh, laid out what the role of a Crofting Commissioner should be. A few um, members, including Stuart Stevenson, made the point about mapping, and it's completely valid about the thickness of a line on a map can make all the difference actually on the ground. And uh, we, we need to make sure that the mapping of the common grazings in particular is um, completed. John Mason, a uh, city boy, talked about land use and said that people in cities had a sympathy with the issue facing crofters, um, as did uh, Minister Hamza Yousaf. And he made the point, which um, I think was completely valid, that uh, a strong population in the Highlands and Islands benefits the whole of Scotland, which uh, I think is fantastic. Um, he also uh, touched on the internal debate about what language should be used, and I think that um, getting the right words is, is very important in a debate and a report like this. Um, just very quickly, John Finney spoke about housing and depopulation um, and what is the purpose of legislation. Mike Rumbles also um, touched on it's all very well for us to pass legislation, but then we need to make sure that it's enacted. Um, and I think that, that would, uh, we would all agree with that. Um, Presiding officer, I don't know if I've managed to cover everyone. I hope I have done. Um, but we hope as a committee that this report and the debate have been helpful in setting the scene for the huge amount of detailed work that uh, lies ahead. We call on the Scottish Government to commit to ensuring the timetable will be structured to ensure parliamentary scrutiny will be completed comfortably before the end of the current session because we must ensure sufficient time for thorough and detailed parliamentary scrutiny. We have a commitment from the Scottish Government to a national development plan for crofting. 
We must send the message that our Crofton communities are valued and that we will support them. Presiding officer, I commend this report to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's report on crofting. We're moving to decision time, and the first question today is that motion 5351 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee on Deer Management be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're all agreed. And the second and final question is that motion 5245 in the name of Edward Mountain on the Rural Economy and Connectivities Report on a Review of Priorities for Crofting Law Reform be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That con concludes decision time. We'll move to members' business in the name of John Finney on ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.